just to let me tell you, I'm a woman of faith. I am a woman of faith to the bone. I laugh and I joke, I do not play, and I, I, I don't come to offend anybody, anything like that. I'm keenly sensitive and aware of the fact that there are other faiths and religions and belief systems. I come to offend no man. But if God had told me that I had to bury two sons to be able to do the work I'm doing now, I would have told him, get himself another girl. Well, Tim, I thank you for the uh, opportunity to share my perspective on life and share um, how you get beyond wounds and pain. You know, it's a lot of difficulty going on today. And I think about, I've had conversations when, when people talk about the times we've been in for the last two years. I think about the Bias family had their time. 36 years ago, and then um, 32 years ago, the difficulties that we had to endure in the deaths of both of our sons. I mean, it's things that in the natural, you it's not possible to recover from and be authentic and be real. You know, not putting on airs and pretending like, you know, everything is apple hunky dory and I attribute uh, the majority of that to my faith and understanding that life is a bowl with a lemon and honey in it. Sometimes it's sweet and sometimes it can be so bitter. And no matter how we paint this picture of how we want our life, there are always going to be rocks in the road, pebbles, mosquito bites, you name it, you know, we keep trying to find this place where, where, where life won't find us, mm. but life will find you. I was just looking at pictures not long ago of um, Len actually signing his um, letter of intent to attend the University of Maryland. And we were in the library of then Northwestern High School the old Northwestern High School. Yes. And um, just being reflective of that, and my husband and I, we were so innocent. Len was so innocent. And we just said, oh, our son has an opportunity to go and play ball um, at the collegiate level and get a scholarship. The NBA wasn't even in, in view. And we were very, very, very excited about that because when I think back, I remember just how Len grew up and he wasn't the tenacity that he had when he played basketball, that developed in him. I never saw him, you know, just being forceful because he was always very sensitive and and not really loud not soft spoken you know he just i just never dreamed that he would evolve into the athlete that he did and just thinking back when he was um in school signing and the innocence of my husband and I and the youthfulness and just thinking back and to see where it all evolved to. It's absolutely amazing and that I still uh, am still sitting here clothed in my right mind most of the time, some of the time. Well, most of the uh, people that knew him, especially adults, spoke of his personality and how mannerable he was and had a, a sense of character about him, you know, good character development. But when he picked up the ball, he turned into something else. He turned into something else. But we always looked forward um, to his games, to the abilities that he had. It, it was just a phenomenal season that we wished could have stayed summertime all of the time. And that's what happens in life. 
when seasons change. You know, we it was summertime and we thought it was going to remain summertime and it did not. And the fall came and then the winter and here we are 36 years later still having a conversation and that is what amazes me today. 36 years later still having conversations about uh, this man. We're living in a different time and there are different narratives. We, we are living almost 40 years ahead. And when you look back, you say, well, it should have been what it is today, but it wasn't back then. I mean, you had no idea that um, circumstances would take the turn that they would. You know, and I have to say that on the um, on the actual day that Len returned home, I was not home when he returned from Boston. So I never got to see him when he returned. The next time I saw him was the next morning in the hospital dead. So from from just I think Len was a seed that went down into the ground to awaken people to the importance of having their athletes protected and who's around them and sending out um, messages of hope to the athletes in terms of decision making and who's in their realm of influence and, and the security and seeing something like that happened to a Len Bias, it was a wake up call. And I believe, as I said, in death, he has brought hope and protection to so many athletes that have come after him in all genres. I think about the laws, the drug laws that were, were made during that time. And I look at it as so many people suffered because of the shock of the death of this young man. And when Len died, it was, we've got to get something in place, get something in place. And people asked me, you know, well, wh what do you think about that? And I said, do you know that while they were making the laws, I was bleeding my family and I were bleeding and crying. We didn't know what was going on until it was done. And then you have the couple of years back, there have been questions that have come up about changing laws and so many things have changed. But a lot of people suffered grief and their lives were destroyed to a degree because of some of the laws that were put in place so um, quickly because people could not believe that this great man died. I found out during that time that there were three types of fans in the United States of America. There were Celtic fans, Laker fans, and Michael Jordan fans. Mm -hmm. Three types of fans. And Everyone that gathered around basketball knew the Lakers, Michael Jordan, and the Celtics. The Celtics and the um, Lakers at that time was a rivalry. So um, the East Coast and the West Coast. And I was blown away by the interest that people had in um, basketball, especially at the, I knew at the collegiate level, but not as a nation, what people thought about the sport until Len died. And for all intents and purposes, I really didn't know who he was until he died. I, I, I saw him, I mentioned that before, as my son and an athlete, and we enjoyed him and, you know, great things would come. But when I saw the outpouring of, of the sympathy and the empathy and just the distraught, how distraught people were. It was, it was amazing to me. And as I said before, the cards and letters and flowers that we received from all over the world, I, 
I couldn't believe this was for my son. I, I, I really, I knew he played ball, but I was a mom. That um, it's something that I read from time to time in one of my readings. And it says, in life, you can run from a lion and run into a bear and run from the bear and run in your house and lean on the wall and a viper will bite you. So what is it saying? No matter where you go today, you're going to deal, you're going to deal with the life. And 36 years ago, it was the cup that we had to drink from. But before Len's death, I was a woman of faith. I was a woman of faith. And I have said this so many times that I had premonitions of something happening, but I didn't know what it was. I just had for like 18 months before his, his death, I just had something was just on me that I could not shake. And when when his when the death actually occurred june 19th 1986 it was like once it happened i felt that thing lift off of me that was so heavy that something was going to happen because it had happened and my faith is what brought me through and i tell people and and, and especially today so many things. I, I think about um, the school over in Virginia where the two law enforcement officers were murdered yesterday. We're here in um, Maryland and the, there was on our local news about a small liberal arts school in Virginia. Two police officers, uh, security officers for the campus were murdered. And they were the best of friends. They One was black and the other was white. And one was the best man at the other's funeral. And you think about what those families are going through and you grieve and you pain for them because the suddenly we're in a day of just suddenly things are happening. And where and when it happened with Len 36 years ago, it was very uncommon, you know what I mean, to hear of something like that or even death like that, like we hear it today. But when I heard that yesterday, I, I just said a prayer for the families because it is no way you can be doing your doing life, doing you, and then something suddenly comes like that, the loss of a loved one in such a violent manner. And then all of a sudden you just pick up and go on with your life. You can't. So my faith and my God helped me to get, is sustaining me right now today to even be able to have a conversation with you. And I brought up what happened yesterday because you can't go out and grab faith in the middle of a storm. Mm. You can't try to wait until something happens and then you want all of this downloaded in you for you to be able to make it. You have to start ahead of time of building foundations and coming out of denial that um, it's never going to be me. Very dear friend of mine, she told me the other day that she and another friend of mine never thought that they would have to go to my class in terms of they were separate from me because they had not lost loved ones. And since then, both of them have had to drink from that cup and they understand the bitterness of it and there's nothing good in it. And even though you prepare and you bring your children up, you do all of the right things. And then here comes this thing that happens. You just can't rally yourself together and just say, 
oh, I have faith to go on. Let me go heal the world. Let me go help someone else. No, the only thing you want to do is get in bed and cover your head and not have anybody to talk to you. You don't know how people can smile, how the sun can come out. How can people laugh and talk when you are hurting so bad? And then the thing with Len's death was with him being an icon, as I mentioned before, that I did not know, everybody was crying. Everyone. So <laughs> there was a, a someone, a, a, one of the pastors from the church came to the house to help me and my family, I mean, to give us words of comfort, and I ended up comforting him because it was just, it was just so overwhelming. People were crying everywhere, and we relived that crying even when um, the uh, in March of 1986, when they had the last game for the seniors, and my husband and I went out on that uh, floor to stand with Len because that was going to be his last year at Maryland. The fans, the students, the people were crying because he was leaving. They did not want, they didn't want summer to go. They wanted it to stay summertime. They just wanted, but life isn't like that, Tim. It's just not like that. And just when I look back, I say my faith in God and a mission was birthed out of it through all of the tears and the the pain. I just looked at something before um, we spoke and it said that it's something that I had written and it said that in the valley, people hate the valley. You know, we're always talking about the mountaintop experiences and no one wants to endure the valley. But in the valley, in the, in the stinking, stagnant water of the valley, one of the most beautiful flowers grows, and that's the lily. So out of all of that mess, something comes up out of it. And no matter how deep our valleys are, if you keep the faith, and if you can have great support systems and people praying for you and God on your side, you can make it. But it's people that that really are uh, know God and they're about out of their mind today. I mean, they 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 don't know what they're going to do. So it's just that deep rooted faith that you have to have to endure today. And that's why I'm still speaking still traveling because I believe in the human spirit. I believe the best is yet to come and we have to press forward. So I took the long way of saying my faith is what kept me and helped me to get through. And my husband, teamwork, my God, mm. so many families have broken up once they have experienced something so devastating. But my husband in 36 years has never dropped the ball in covering his family. Mm. I mean, can you imagine a man losing one son, then losing two sons and then releasing his wife to go and speak and still have two children there. And it's not like, he, he was just, oh, let me go. I mean, the suffering that we have to endure in this life. And that's what people don't want today. That's why the hardships we're dealing with today, people don't want to be bothered with because nobody wants to suffer. They want to follow the yellow brick road. And it's not summertime anymore. It's winter. When Len died, the press was on my front lawn for weeks. The people that ran in my house that I did not know in my refrigerator, I mean, and, and people were just all over my house trying to help. And it was this, it was this, it was chaotic. I was saying, 
what are they doing in my house? And they were only trying to help because they didn't know anything else to do. And then after Jay's death, when Jay died, I was so angry with God and so mad with God. I, I didn't know what to do. I stayed in my bedroom for three days and didn't come out. And someone would bring me a glass of water and I, I would throw it up against the wall. I didn't talk to anyone because I said, this is so unfair. Why me? And then the, the, the um, media was out on my front lawn again. But this time I told my oldest brother, who's a big man like you, I said, don't let anyone in my house. I don't want anyone in here. No one, no one, no one. So. It, 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 we walked through the fire. We walked through the fire and we cried and we grieved. And, and I know where I am in my grief, but I still have two remaining children. I still have my husband. They, they, I, I don't know what they're still enduring from that. You see what I'm saying? Though we have all picked up our beds and started to move forward. The pain still has to be there. The loneliness, how they miss both of their brothers. We were such a close family, a loving family. And just to think of them continuing to stand, I believe it's because of the faith that God has given me to stand in strength to help my family. But my husband continuing, continuing to cover and to stand and to bless and out of all of those ashes that you think you're never going to breathe again. And just all that we had to go through, all that we had to go through, you find out about trusting people and thinking people are going to do the right thing. <laughs> oh, it's a wake up call. Life has gained. I'm not kidding you. And you can go around thinking that you know it all, but you, as my mother used to say, you live and you learn. And pain, discomfort, disappointments are all our teachers. And what are our takeaways from life's lessons? Doctor, what about the legal aspects of it all? You know. Well, the legal aspects of it all that that went down, we were just a um, a family in Prince George's County with uh, living here. We had a, not a lot of money. We're just an average uh, an average um, family, and then we had to fight the powers that be, and it, there was there was there was no fight. And from Len's death. I think I may have mentioned this before, the Bias family got nothing from nobody. I mean, nobody gave us anything, nobody. The contract that um, the insurance policy with Lords of London, they didn't give Reebok, the University of Maryland, um, Advantage International, um, you name it. Nobody gave us nothing, the lawyers, and catch this, even the people that donated money, it was sent to it was sent to our lawyers, but we never saw any of that. So we we got nothing. So you talk about the legal aspect. And so you're fighting the powers that be. You pick up your bed, then walk. You understand, you know, what are you gonna do? Kick the slats out of your crib and God downloaded me with strength to have a mission to go forth and that's why we're still standing anyhow now just to let me tell you i'm a woman of faith i am a woman of faith to the bone i laugh and i joke i do not play and i i, I don't come to offend anybody anything like that i'm keenly sensitive and aware of the fact that there are other faiths and religions and belief systems i come to offend no man but if God had told me that I had to bury two sons to be able to do the work I'm doing now, I would have told him, get itself another girl. 
because this this right here is nothing to play with. Death of a loved one, death of children and standing on one son's grave burying another and then all of the disappointments and that no money, no money, no money, no money, no no compensation, no anything. Just my husband and I and God in the center and our two children. And we're standing here today and the prayers of people that prayed for us. The only people that know what happened in that room with Lem Bias are the men that was in, were in there. And I'll leave that there. They know what happened. They know what happened in that room. There's a lot of innuendo about this, that, and the other. But the men that were in the room with him, they know what happened. Okay. So the person that um, murdered Jay, I tell you a quick story about um, forgiveness. Um, I was doing a, an event with a group of women that I was not familiar with, but one of my colleagues said, "No, you you need to go do do be be with these women." And they had an event um, actually on the west lawn of the White House and. I went ahead, I mean, not the White House, the Capitol. And I participated once I got there. It was a beautiful event. I really didn't know, but a couple of people there. I didn't know the group I had on the same shirts they had on. I did my part. And when it was over, a lady uh, came up to me and she said, Dr. Bias, I enjoyed your message uh, very much. I said, oh, thank you. And she said to me, I don't know whether you know it or not, but I'm the sister of the man that murdered your son, Jay. And she was in the same shirt I had on. You see what I'm saying? A Christian woman, this, that, and the other. And I said, well, oh, how are you doing? She said, we're doing fine. I said, well, how is your mom? She said, my mom is over there under the tree because it was so hot. It was in August. And once I got over there, the, there were a lot of family members over there and I went over and I greeted them. And when I met her mom, she said, it's been 25 years. I said, it has, it's been a long time. And I asked her how she had been doing, but just greeting the family and only God can give you the power for me and the strength to be not bitter, not mad, taking it out on the family. You know what I mean? It was something that happened. I was very, very broke up and tore up about my son, Jay. I did not like what went down in the courtroom. I remember sitting there listening to, in the courtroom with Jay, the, the, the process, the, I don't know, whichever attorney was representing the young man that killed Jay, um, say all manner of things about Jay. And I jumped up and called him a liar. I said, you're a liar. And the press went off. And when I got myself calmed down the next day when we came to court and the, the press asked me how I felt, I said, it was the heart of a mother. That's what you heard, the heart of a mother in that courtroom. So, I mean, you talk about stuff. I have walked in stuff people will not even believe, but there again, my faith in my God has kept me. You know, Tim, when I look at you, the first thing I thought about is when uh, we were able to hear each other is how Len and Jay used to use uh, the little old, this is when they were young boys. They used to pretend they were Howard Cosell <laughs> interviewing Muhammad Ali. And both of them loved to talk. And when I saw you at the mic, <laughs> I thought about Jay and Len being where you are today. Oh. But they're not. It's not a sad thing. Yeah. It's not a sad thing, but it came back to me. It came back to me. Well, I keep seeing Jay. 
because I, I saw them all the time. And I worked at the plaza for a while as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. I'm very intimately acquainted with the surroundings of Prince George's Plaza. The area. And the mm-hmm. whole, and, and everything that took place. And, and then, mm-hmm. I, you know, I've been to Leland and like I said, I grew yeah. up in Riverdale. So it's I couldn't all... believe I could just couldn't believe Leland that I was going back to the same hospital with the same bad news. I, I it, when you think about it, I, one of my girlfriends and I say, and this is some people that maybe Christians may get offended, but I say, you know, God played too much for me. Mm. <laughs> he played too much for me. The same hospital the same bad news and this, that, and the other. And, and then you are walking in grace, in grace and in light to accomplish the things that you didn't think you would be able to do. You did not throw in the towel because even though you didn't like it and it was so bitter and the cup was so nasty, even though it was so nasty, you kept walking, and that's by the grace of God. Recently, Lynn was inducted into the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame. So what was that experience like? Oh what, my what can you tell us? I can tell you that God is good. That's all I can say. For us to live 36 years later and then to see this and people come up to you and say, like, it's nothing, you know, third, they should have done it a long time ago. I said, listen, it's still cake, no matter when it comes. I, I, I'm not worried about that. What I'm grateful for is that God gave us, my family and I, the strength to endure this hardship that we would live to see his blessing and um, the celebration of Lynn as a collegiate athlete. It was absolutely phenomenal. And then on top of that, I have, I don't know if I mentioned to you that I have six grandchildren. Hmm. And three of my, my three oldest grandchildren are, They've all graduated from college and the three boys are athletes. Two played football and one played um, basketball. My oldest grandson graduated from Goucher right over in Baltimore. And my granddaughter and my grandson graduated from Bowie State. They were not born because my daughter, when Len died, I mean, she was just out of high school. So they have heard the stories and because of the internet, they were able to go on and um, check things, research and our stories because we celebrate both Jay and Len. We celebrate them. We celebrate them. We, we, oh, don't talk about that. Oh, no, no, no. We celebrate them and we laugh about the good times we had and different things like that. So the beauty of it was him being inducted in the Hall of Fame is that five of my grandchildren, my daughter, my son, myself, and my husband, it, it, there were almost 20 of us that went there to see this happen. And it was absolutely phenomenal. My grandchildren still talk about, they're young men and young, you know, a young woman and, and all of my grandsons, you know, they're on their own. They work every day, They they, but for them to go out there and to experience that, Oh, not only that, to celebrate with the other inductees, that was that was really wonderful. December 4th, Maryland had a gold day and they were remembering Len Bias and they were honoring him, celebrating him. And they gave away 4000 Len Bias jerseys and had them all over the chairs. I I should have sent you those pictures, but I I wasn't thinking. But 
over the seats. It was it was beautiful. And all of the students had on his jersey. And my husband and I went back out on center court. And um, the people just cheered, just cheered, just cheered, just cheered and just said, um, welcome back home. Welcome back home. So it the year (laughs) 2021 was a fabulous year for me. Some people were crying, but it was a fabulous year for me. And coming into 2022, I'm twice as excited as I was about 2021 because of the foundation, because of the celebratory um, recognition of Len. You know, it kind of gets you past that part and you can go on. And people still have interests and those sorts of things, but not bringing closure, but just going full circle from 1986 back to 2021, uh, December of 2021 at the University of Maryland. There is no progress or change without sacrifice. We talk a lot about what happened during slave times, my mother's time, grandmother, great-grandmother, going back generations. But there were sacrifices that were made for us to have what we have today. And a better day is coming for our people because of the seeds that have been sown and the crying and the sorrow that parents have gone through for it to be a better day. We want things just to change, but systems, belief systems have been here forever. And we have to, there is a process in breaking the system down. And even though their children, I think about the George Floyd and the the people who have lost children, just in the last five or six years, the changes that have been made, I mean, people should be rejoicing to see the changes in the, in the, in the uh, public places, the different things, the mindsets, there's still a lot going on, but there are a lot of truth that has changed the way people look at us as a people. It's been marvelous change if you can sit outside and look at it. My pet peeve now is that we have everyone's attention Let's show them how much better our communities can be and how we help one another. Be Speaks Life, and that is my uh, business where I do workshops and travel and speak and, you know, encouragement, inspiration. Then we have the foundation that we have realigned and got it set up. Um, uh, all of last year, that's what I worked on. The, and now it's the Bias Foundation Incorporated and we're, we are ready. In the foundation, we have a program called MOVE, making ourselves victorious every day. We believe that our youth and our families and community are reachable, teachable, lovable, and savable. We have to change our approach and to adapting to their needs. What worked in 2010 is not going to ride in 2022. We everything is is new. It's everything is moving fast, fast, fast. But when it comes to meeting the needs of community and family, mothers, fathers, men, women, children, we use old antiquated uh, tools to help them. And today the greatest tool that we can have is unconditional caring. We just don't tell people you have to get over it. You know, I I buried two sons and this is the truth, but I have helped people who were on the verge of suicide that had not buried anyone. But the grief that they were going with from the challenges of life that they had experienced, I didn't say, look at me, I buried two sons, you should, no. 
because everybody has their own weight of burdens of life that they have to deal with. All of us are unique. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Nobody has the same fingerprints, the same pupils in their eyes. All of us are unique and problems that life presents affects all of us differently. So we, we through the foundation, we don't minimize the challenges that people are going through. Just get over it. You ought to know. The first thing people tell young boys, you know, pull your pants up. Fix what are you talking about? The young girls, cover yourself up. Why don't, you know, calm down. Just calm down. These are trends and every generation have their trends, what they're doing. The thing is unconditional caring. How can people find out more about the foundation? And, and if they want to, you know, invite you out because they, they might need to encourage some other Oh, folks. yeah. Oh, yeah. They can um, go to my website, uh, www.drlanisebias.com. Bias Foundation website is www.biasfoundation.org. And um, there are links there to um, for donations, that type of thing. And if they have any questions, there's email, a bias email. They can email me and, you know, we just... It, it, life has been good. That's all I can say. And if, I, if, if it was anything else that I would have to add, it would be life is hard. And we have to stop trying to find this place where we won't have any problems. It does not exist. What we have to do is manage ourselves as the problems come they only come to develop our character and to develop the non-marketable wealth that we have within us. Because I'm only here today because I had treasures deep down within me that I didn't know. But the only way you can get it up is through hardship. You're back up against the wall and you have to dig deeper. And it's nothing new for me because our ancestors did it. Here we are today, anyhow. They didn't see us, but they endured hardship like good soldiers. So you could be Tim Black, I could be Dr. Bias, K. Lovejoy, and on and on and on and on. Because as Dr. King says, one of his quotes that I love, he says, we beg time to stop and time marches on, ignoring our every plea. And he says, over the jumbled bones of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late, too late. Gratitude is the, the greatest form of gratitude, is gratitude. Do you know what I mean? Being grateful, we take so much for granted. I mean, we have so much to be grateful for, but if you forget where you came from or no one told you the story of where our people came from, then you don't have gratitude. And you have gratitude when you understand that there is an evolution to how we got here. Yes, I've been to hell and back. Yes, I cried. The, 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 the Mary Mary say, I cried my last tear yesterday. I'm telling you, have done all of that. But guess what, Tim? I wouldn't take anything for my journey. Anything for what life has taught. Because I know that my goal is, is to encourage, inspire, and tell people, don't throw in the towel. And throwing in the towel is a boxing term that when the boxers, the opponents are in the ring battling and battling and battling and, and one is getting the best of the other, the, 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 the corner will throw the towel in and say he can't take no more. He can't take no more. But we are here today because men and women took it all. We are the fruit of everything. And what will be the fruit for the generations after us? That's why I'm here to encourage. What a philosophy. 
What a philosophy. Dr. Bias, I want to thank you once again for spending time with us. Folks, the links where to go to find out more about Dr. Bias's foundation and her good work will be in the description box below. Uh, once again, sister, thank you for sharing your time. You are amazing, and uh, you're so graceful. And so Can graceful. I say one more thing, Please Tim? Do. Please. I just thank you. I thank you, the great work you do, and um, so many times people think that um, a pastor is someone in a church or something like that, but what I see you and so many other people doing, you're like an, an urban missionary. You know what I mean? You're an urban physician, a physician of value. You know, so many people like you. And when we can reach back and try to help somebody, let's stop beating everybody up. Let's try to learn to love and value one another because brotherhood and sisterhood is real. And for us to be the authentic people that our ancestors died for is for us to be able to appreciate and love one another and continue to build, continue to build. The best is yet to come. Whenever the coaches call his team to practice, whether it's tennis, which I love, football, basketball, baseball, you can go on and on. He doesn't call one team out to practice. He has one team that's for offense, and he calls another team out that's for defense. And defense's objective is to keep the offense from scoring, and the offense's objective is to score in spite of the defense. Sometimes the things of life that come your way, there is no offense like it was for the Bias family. We had to use defense, defense, and defense is your faith. With that being said, keep fighting the good fight of faith and keep helping God's people. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Bias, for your time, sister. This is, uh, it worked out. It worked out. We got it done. We got it done. 